This is Tracy Tukahama Spinoza, and this video is on flipping the classroom. We're going to look at how technology can be leveraged to achieve better learning outcomes. We're going to do this today in the context of two big parts. First, we're going to look at basic presumptions that I have about education and why I believe that this is actually a great tool. Um, some definitions uh, that are connected to the idea of flipping a classroom. And then we're going to go into part two, which has to do with actually how do we structure our classrooms in that sense. The main presumptions I have, if I ask you, what is the purpose of education? You know, is it meant to socialize individuals or to emancipate them? Or can it be possibly both? Um, for those of you in the camp that believe that education is meant to socialize, it means that we have a hopes that the students that come out of our systems are actually going to be able to be a contribution to society, and that sounds positive, right? Those of you who are in the camp of, um, of emancipation, it, it really is the, the basic cornerstone of Greek philosophy and, and education, and that the free you are, the better choices you make, and therefore we have a better democracy to live in. And so the idea that I'd like to propose here is that I'm not looking for a philosophical debate. I do believe that flipping can actually contribute to both of these goals in very distinct ways, and, and we're going to look at that in just a few minutes. Second, is it my obligation to differentiate to meet the needs of all the learners in my classroom? And is that even possible? We hear a lot today about the importance of the 21st century classrooms and being able to be very inclusive in our teaching and also to differentiate the needs of individual students, understanding that they're not all going to start at the same place. So do you think it is? Do you think it isn't? Is it something that you're not even sure about? Many people think that, yes, I, I am responsible for my students. But a whole lot of you might be responding that you don't think it's even possible. Uh, that students need to be responsible for their own learning because it's impossible for one individual to be responsible for all the others. So I'd like to look at this question a little bit deeper when we talk about the potential of flipping the classroom and what does that mean for that particular question. Third, if I ask you, is it better to teach wide or deep? This is really a, a key to our education. We do teach a lot of subjects and we do uh, hit upon a lot of different things, but rather superficially. So if you're in the wide category, this means that we have a broad scan uh, of the field. And a lot of people think that's very important for introductory courses or in their scope. But others believe that um, deep is better. If you have the option to study um, poetry during the semester, is it better to deeply analyze you know, three poems in one semester than to superficially analyze ten? This again is a difference in, in philosophy. And uh, again, the, the idea here is that the flipped classroom could actually help you do both depending on the objective of the course. If it is an introductory course, maybe there's some value in doing a broad scan. But we know in general, having a deeper look at a few things helps you understand the thinking about that particular type of genre of literature or that particular concept in science. Uh, as opposed to just rushing over things in a very superficial way. And fourth and finally, should we be teaching you know, content or should we be teaching to the test because kids have to get into college, right? Or should we be trying to develop memory abilities or should we be looking at thinking skills? And should we be looking at people who pass exams or are we looking to create lifelong lovers of learning? Um, or can we do all of these things? Can you teach the content and to the test and do memory and thinking skills and create lifelong lovers of learning who do pass exams well? Well, I tend to think that it's great that we're covering information and not only just shooting to try to pass a test. Having said that, it's really interesting to look at the studies now that are coming out that show that when you develop uh, critical thinking skills in kids, when you take the time to focus on an executive functions, those kids actually also do well on tests, not just develop critical thinking skills. But when you have kids who are only focused on passing a test, they don't necessarily develop critical thinking skills. So you have to think of, you know, where our priorities should lie in education. Um, when we think about, you know, do we want them to have memoristic abilities just to pass that test, or do we want them to develop deep thinking skills? I hope that we're looking at longer term thinking skills, but that we recognize that you can't get good thinking without memory. So they're very closely related. And if we're hopefully, I would say in education, you know, where you just get, try to get kids to pass from one grade to the next, um, I hope that that's changing. I really hope that most of us are really focused on giving kids those skills that they can actually be lifelong lovers of learning, that they enjoy exploring new ideas, that they are trying to uh, resolve problems and collaborate and work with others to make a better society for all of us. So hopefully we're going to try to aim for all of those things. I would like to make the case today that if we flip our classrooms, we're going to have a higher potential of achieving these kinds of goals, these more lofty and tangible goals of creating lifelong lovers of learning uh, than we would in the traditional uh, brick and mortar settings that we have today. So let's clarify some of these key concepts. Something that we're going to use and refer to um, has to do with backward design. So I'd like to ask if you know what it is. Um, would you say it's a philosophy of life? Or would you say it's a way to design curricula? Or would you say it's a way to conduct lesson planning? Or is it all of the above? Or is it none of these things? It's actually all of the above. 
there's only three steps in backward design and if you look at them they could be applied to you know a general philosophy of life or educational planning or even classroom work you know on the day-to-day -day basis so what is the focus of backward design it means identifying the results that we want at the end of the day what are the objectives of this class or of this course or of my life you know what am I trying to get out of it once that is clear, then you'll determine what kind of indicators you'll accept that will give you the evidence you need to evaluate and say, yes, we're making progress towards those objectives, right? And then finally, the third step, once you know your objective, once you know how you're going to measure it, then you decide what are the activities you're going to use. So I want to put this into context because flipping is not necessarily for everything and every, um, every class that you're going to have. So once you know what types of objectives you're trying to achieve there and how you're going to measure that, then we decide, we make a decision whether or not the activity that should be used or the modality should be flipping or not. A second key word I'd like to share with you has to do with competencies or educational competencies. In education, the OECD has defined these as being the combination of knowledge, skills, and attitudes that an individual acquires throughout uh, learning processes. So knowledge is basically dates, facts, figures, formulas, concepts, anything that you can find on Google easily, right? Skills are how to apply the knowledge and attitudes have to do with your perspective taking or the values you attribute to the knowledge that you're learning. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to challenge you with this idea that we know that the things that can be Googled maybe should be and the time in our class should actually be better used to teach students the skills and attitudes related to that content knowledge. Dr. Mitra did amazing studies starting in 2004 that have expanded all the way up into the present in which he's found that students, given access to good technology, can actually self-teach. They self-organize and can self-teach entire curriculums in a shorter amount of time than they could do with a teacher. So what does this concept really mean in terms of our teaching? Our job description has changed thanks to technology. There's this big question out there related to what is appropriate use of technology. And Ian Jukes likes to say that, you know, do we really need teachers if we, if we have Google? The main idea that he, he delivers is that basically any teacher that can be replaced by machine should be replaced by machine. Because what we're looking at is that teachers don't just hover at this knowledge level. Anything that can be Googled, you know, that the teachers spend a lot of time teaching formulas or a lot of time defining concepts. And the idea here would be that can we modify that so that the teachers can now shift and spend more of their time delving into the skills or the attitudes and the value-laden aspects of the learning as opposed to just that superficial level. So what is the basic definition of a flipped classroom? We like to think of it as, in Jukes' terms, this would be something that's like disruptive innovation. It's something that we're not used to, it shakes us up, some of us are fearful of it, so how does it actually work? Han says that basically the traditional old uh, model of teaching where the teacher sort of views at the students is just going to be blown away by the idea of flipping. And Bergen reminds us that, you know, if you're correctly flipping, the emphasis is not on what's delivered in the video, it's actually what you can now do with the time that you would have free uh, to be able to work directly with the students. So what happens? In a traditional model, you know, the teacher uh, gets up there, gives a lecture, shares definitions, explains a formula, does some examples, and then sends homework to the kids so they're actually practicing at home. Well, the idea here is the opposite. We send those definitions home in a video lecture, and then when the students come to class, we actually use the information. So the flipped classrooms is, is really, it's a means, not an end in itself. So teachers really still have to use flipping as more of a tool than presuming it's, the, then it's a shortcut to learning. It's just another tool, but it's a powerful tool. It can be done uh, throughout the semester and, and used in every single class, or it can be something that's used very sparingly and only with a few concepts that are taught in the classroom. Uh, and it's just a tool, as we mentioned before, and it's here to stay. There's more and more evidence that when you flip well, when it's done well, this is a very powerful way of elevating the level of thinking in the classroom. Flipping is very, very new. What's really fascinating is that it's tied to probably the oldest teaching method that exists, the Socratic method. You know, never tell what you can ask. Flipping is very powerful because it creates a platform where students reflect deeply about what their own gaps in knowledge are before they get to class so that they can take advantage of being with the teacher to clarify where their areas are of misunderstanding or where they need more clarification. So it actually turns it around instead of the teacher asking all the questions, it forces the students to reflect on their own level of learning. And it also ups the game. It moves us more towards mastery learning instead of just covering the material. So then it comes down to this, how would you decide what it is you flip? Basically, the single question you have to ask yourself is, what is the best use of my face-to-face -face time? 
And if you think it's just lecturing or, or, or repeating uh, formulas or helping, you know, one kid in the back who didn't get number seven and, and going over and using your time for that, okay, keep doing things the way we've always done it. I frankly think that that's a huge waste of time. So I think you'd be far better off um, using your face-to-face -face time to create debate and to get people uh, to experiment with the information, to use and apply the knowledge and to critique it and to come up with better ideas. So I'd like to suggest that you can choose what you flip using three basic filters. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy, uh, the core concepts that we know that there'll be a huge spectrum of previous knowledge uh, related to that new concept, and then this idea of universal design for learning. Related to Bloom's taxonomy, uh, a, a good rule of thumb is that flip the things that are at the bottom of Bloom. Uh, make the videos for things that need to be memorized. The second idea has to do with um, prior knowledge. We know that um, learning is expedited when a student has an association with prior knowledge that's relative to the new learning. So since all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience, if a kid knows something about the concept, he speeds up the pace at which he can learn a new concept. So if you know how to add, I can teach you how to subtract in probably about 10 different steps really quickly. But if you have gaps in your understanding of addition and I try to teach you subtraction, you're going to need a lot more rehearsal. So the idea here is if there are concepts that you think that some kids have, there's going to be a wide spectrum in your class of what kids know and don't know, then those are the kinds of things that you could also choose to flip. This basically means that some kids, you know, might just need, uh, they need no repetition because they already know the concept or they need very little because it's associated with something they already understand. Or there are some people, and this is Marsano's work, that can actually need you know, 30, 40, 50 uh, introductions or repetitions of a concept before they actually get that concept. So flipping the classroom actually creates the space for you to differentiate in this way. You can attend to those kids who need more repetition, but you don't bore the kids who don't need that much repetition. The third filter that you can use in choosing what you should flip is related to universal design for learning. And this is this core concept of, you know, most people need whatever, but some people need something else. Most people can use stairs, but some people need ramps. Okay, so let's use ramps for everyone. This is basically looking for a, a common denominator which we can end as an entry point so that people who need more, it's available. The classroom will provide for that. And people who need less don't have to be bored with the repetition that exists there. So flipping the classroom would actually give students multiple pathways into that new learning concept. So what are some example studies? There's been a lot of research done since flipping came out. In one study in Michigan, they found that students who did flipping actually learned at twice the rate of students who were using traditional models of just uh, plain textbooks or, or lecture format. Uh, in Marcy and Brin's study, they found in a, in a university course from that um, by flipping, they actually had all of their students improve somewhat on tests and quizzes. And Eric Mazur's work, um, who has claimed to being one of the fathers of this whole concept, um, after 21 years of flipping in, in a course on thermodynamics, he finds far greater satisfaction on the part of the students as well as better learning outcomes. So in Weissman's study in 2012, which is basically a white paper for the White House, uh, they basically recognize this is a whole different paradigm of teaching. It really breaks the mold of the traditional way we've gone about educating, and it actually creates an environment more conducive to higher level learning. In Strayer's dissertation in 2007, he identified, though, that there's a fear of some teachers to actually do this, because when you up your game, when you're actually saying we're going to do all the dates, facts, figures, formulas beforehand, it means that in the classroom, you really have to know how to do application of those things. And when you up your game like that, um, it can scare teachers because teachers have been so used to teaching at this lower level of thinking for so long that they, they might be fearful uh, of this new technology. Okay, big question for you. MOOCs, it's a word that's been floating around all over the place. Massive online open courses, right? These are the things that are for free that you can get online that have famous professors um, giving you these great, great classes. Uh, is this flipping? Yes, no, I don't know. No, in general, no. There might be some very new exceptions out there, but traditionally speaking, or since uh, in the past few years as MOOCs have evolved, they tend to be just recorded lectures with massive exam structures to, to, that try to get a large number of students to get through a certain amount of material. I understand there are new experiments going on right now with peer grading in some MOOC course rooms in order to provide more formative feedback to individuals, but a MOOC is not flipping the classroom in general. So what do you think? Does flipping work just then in, in small groups or in big groups, in both large and small groups? It basically works in all size classrooms. It can be done on an individual scale, as you've seen sometimes um, 
the uh, experience in the Khan Academy where they have short videos and then they have um, self-teaching on a one-on-one -on -one kind of a level. But you can also do this in a larger classroom with many more students as well. How is this related to this idea of mind-brain education science? We know that many teachers just don't know quite enough about the brain, but if you give them this information, they also see this link to flipping. If we combine or nurture education with information from psychology and neuroscience, you'll find that some ideas, you know, human brains are as unique as human faces. Yes, they are. And what does this mean for flipping? This means that there are individual needs that are going to be different, so we can't just use one single mode of teaching to reach all the students equally. It also reminds us there's a key element here about differentiating, uh, of how we use uh, disability learning, how do you treat students who might need that little extra leg up. So since each brain is unique and uniquely organized, we have to create a structure that has that flexibility or the level of resources available that can meet all of those different needs. True or false? All brains are equally prepared for all tasks. No. Unfortunately, you know, you inherit genes and you can potentiate those genes in different ways, but everybody's going to be at slightly different starting points with new concepts that we teach in class. So it's very important to be able to, this gets back again to this idea of being able to differentiate and meet the student where their starting point is, not where the textbook says that they should be. Another question, true or false? Past information influences how we learn something new? Absolutely. We know that some kids are going to have a lot of prior experience related to the new concepts we're going to teach in class, and therefore they will learn really quickly. But if a student has no connection to a new idea that we bring to class, no prior experience in which he can actually make a reference to or associate information, then it will take him a lot longer to learn the same concept with somebody who has had prior experience with that information. This means that we have to know our students well enough or we have to create formats, structures, like flipping, that create different levels of knowledge so that the individual student can actually identify his or her own gaps and have the resources within our room to be able to fill in those gaps. True or false? Do brains seek novelty as well as patterns? Yes, they do. Part of human survival is being able to find out what's different in information. And we also know that the brain naturally, to conserve energy, naturally looks for what patterns exist. So by creating a format in which we flip, we're creating the possibility for the students to identify patterns in their prior knowledge as well as better, stronger, or multiple examples of what might be different or novel to their old, uh, to their old references of learning. Attention and memory are equal to learning. A little bit too simplistic, but the idea is, is, is true, that you cannot have new learning if you don't have attention. You can't have new learning if you don't have memory. So you have to pay attention and you have to remember things in order for, for long-term learning to occur. What does this mean in our class? When things are novel, um, they call attention to themselves. When they give a pattern, then it enhances memory pathway. So the idea here is that we have to take advantage of that in the way we structure classes in the 21st century. Other benefits that can be seen in using the flipped classroom are related to uh, bigger concepts. This comes from my book on making classrooms better, 50 practical applications of mind-brain education science. We know that spaced versus massed teaching um, has benefits in long-term memory. So instead of saying in, in, uh, if you have five hours to study, you study all five hours in one day, it's much better if you study an hour, an hour, an hour, an hour spread out over several days because of the strengthening of memory pathways. When we create a flipped classroom format, the platform permits the students not only to do intensive learning within the classroom contact with the teacher, but they can spread out their learning moments over time and review at a time of their convenience, which is more flexible to them, but provides them the time to, at a calm moment, review information and maybe multiple times. Virtual platforms that create the flipped classroom structure also are far better at giving feedback. There are multiple moments for being able to give feedback to the student and these can either be digitalized and you know self-corrected things or they can be the feedback that the, the teacher is able to give by viewing how long the student uh, spent reviewing certain concepts uh, where they seem to get stuck on information and being able to be more attentive to the individual students needs in that way. It's also important to see that uh, related to the brain and how the brain learns, a highly anxious or stressed brain is not going to learn. And we know that in the flipped classroom structure, you actually reduce anxiety because there's less of the social stigma of not getting it. If you don't understand something in class, it takes a lot of courage to raise your hand and say, can you repeat that again? And even if you do do that, you have a bunch of other people snickering behind you and thinking, oh, you're so slow. Well, if you're in a virtual classroom, that doesn't happen to you. You reduce anxiety because you're able to allow that student to get the repetition he needs of certain concepts and to hear it in multiple different ways 
that might not be provided in a face-to-face brick-and-mortar classroom. There's also a, quite a lot of literature out that really speaks to the importance of good student-teacher relationships. The idea that the teacher transmits to the student, I know you can do this, I think you can do this, I believe in you. Uh, because the student's own self-perception of a learner is so crucial to his learning. Uh, related to student-teacher relationships, does the flipped classroom enhance and humanize classroom relationships? Does it make it easier to know what each student needs? Does it help students identify their own gaps in knowledge? Does it speed up learning? Does it allow learning to take place in more depth? A, B, C, E, or A or D? It's basically all of these things except for speeding up new learning. The steps that it takes to understand something are still there. But the brain does need to go through certain steps and construct that knowledge in an orderly way in any event. So it could be faster, but that's not necessarily something that's been proven yet. At the end of the day, we know that students really like the flipped classroom. They say that it gives them enough time. After watching the videos, they can go to school the next morning and they can talk to their teacher about things. So it gives them time to formulate good questions. So they have enough time to reflect on the new learning. It also allows them to have a lot more repetition um, to do the hard stuff, you know, when the teachers are there so that they can get into depth and not be left to do homework that they're unable to, to attempt on their own. It also allows for a greater flexibility of students who need more time to take more time and students who are bored with the class to go faster. Students also have acknowledged that they enjoy the autonomy of their own learning. They enjoy understanding that they can guide themselves in their learning to a certain extent by really using the different tools that are available to them in the classroom. And finally, there's a great benefit to students who might be second language learners or students with learning difficulties such as ADHD or dyslexia dyscalculia. We find that many students using the flipped classroom have enough time then to review the information and feel confident with it before they actually apply it. So in the balance of things, uh, there's a benefit in that the grades are in the hands of the students. It's not like the students can say, oh, why did you give me that grade? Because they know, well, why didn't you take advantage of the resources in the classroom? So the learning is really in the hands of the students, and therefore, you know, the grades that they have are, are also in the hands of the students. The students have to come back to the teacher with really good questions. They have to be able to say, you know, uh, why is it that sometimes that negative sign before the parentheses makes the, the answer negative, and why is it positive? They have to be able to refine the level of their question. They just can't say, I don't get it, you know, I don't get parentheses. They have to be able to identify their own, their own gaps in knowledge so that the teacher can be more precise in giving feedback and helping differentiate the lesson. The great benefits are uh, when, a, when a flipped classroom is really well armed, then you have multiple resources and multiple entry points to help different types of students use different types of tools to, to reach mastery learning in different areas. And the overall structure really lends itself to you know, formative embedded assessment along the way. There's a lot more feedback that students receive and therefore there's a lot more self-regulation about what they need to do to improve. The drawbacks are that if you don't have a clear objective for learning, uh, you can't flip. So a teacher who just is used to winging things is not going to be able to flip a classroom because you have to have a really clear objective of what you're trying to achieve, know how you're going to measure that, and that flipping has been used because it actually helps you achieve that goal better. This also means that a teacher has to have you know, multiple layered objectives planned. So how do you reach mastery? Well, there's several different ways that you can reach mastery. What are those different levels and how are the, what are the different tools or ways that that student can reach that? A drawback to this, and in many teachers, this is where they stop. There's a lot of front-end preparation to this. You have to actually structure things very well in your virtual classroom. Um, so that you can, in the moment, really enjoy the teaching moments. So, you know, when you're there, you're, you're very mindful of that contact with the student, and you're able to focus on the teaching rather than, you know, where, what do I have to do or what are the gaps I have to fill, because you've already provided for that uh, in your virtual classroom format. Many teachers, having said that, are, are sold on it. They really see that you know, leveraging technology in this way is actually a better way to teach. Uh, it aims towards mastery, not just passing the test or, or covering certain pieces of information in a text. It permits them to be better at differentiating their attention to their students. It allows for time, um, more self-pacing on the part of individual students in order to reach those mastery goals. And it really helps to develop additional 21st century skills, the ability to uh, clearly communicate. How do you collaborate with others? And it permits the teacher um, to be much more caring about the individual students in their class through this idea of, of online platforms can actually can be far more personal than a teacher might be able to do when he is faced with a physical classroom of you know 25, 35 students in front of him. Being able to take the time to review the individual student's progress within the platform also allows that teacher to know the students better.
So finally, who, what, when, where, why, how? How do you do this in modern classrooms? How does flipping actually work? What is it that you need to prepare? Um, basic advice that comes from this is that you have to plan. You have to plan very well. A teacher who's not good at planning is not going to be good at flipping ever. So you need to plan and have very clear objectives uh, that are attached to these mastery learning and the competencies that are related to that really well laid out before you begin this. The recommendation is you don't need to flip everything. Choose carefully. Those things at the bottom of Bloom, for example, those things that are just memoristic concept or definitions or terminology, those things are great for flipping. But when you come to the real application or, or dissecting case studies about things, those things are things that are great for face-to-face -face contact. But the main idea is that a lot of the things that we find that we repeat over and over because different students are getting them at different moments or those aha moments don't come you know, unanimously with the whole group, that different people are going to get things in different times, then we should be able to flip those kinds of things so that we can better the probability that we can have everybody coming in with the same base knowledge to our face-to-face -face classroom. The teachers who consider flipping should actually really look into some of the associations that are related to this. There's a lot of free open resources and societies that are related to flipping the classroom these days that should really be taken advantage of if you're considering doing this in the classroom. Okay, so thank you. If you do have any questions or if you'd like uh, further references on this, um, I highly recommend that you have a look at the book by Bergman and Sam who are some of the first people to put this out there talking about the concept of flipping and how does it actually work. And if nothing else, just look at the video that they have on YouTube that actually summarizes this process. Um, and look into some of these other resources that are available that are fabulous teaching tools that really leverage technology in your classroom and that can be used within this flipped context. And then there's testimonials by other teachers who've uploaded their ideas and have shared, well, this is how my classroom looks now. This is what I got out of it. So I hope that you'll be able to look at that and, and join this community of teachers who are learning this new concept of flipping in order to better student learning outcomes. Thank you very much.